if I'm making a max contribution to my TSP HSA Roth and also ha have an individual investment account, making around 52,000 cash flowing 320, but have about a $50,000 line of credit, do you still recommend putting some, putting something aside as an emergency fund or can you make the line of credit as the emergency fund? Yes. So once you get to that point, Mo, an emergency fund is no longer a value to me once you've hit your emergency fund uh, number, whether it was 20K, 50K, whatever it is. Like once you have a, a set emergency fund of cash and you've hit that goal, and let's say it's three months worth of expenses, six months worth of expenses, I no longer save and I start to redirect savings to an asset that I can collateralize. One of them being like you just said, a line of credit. The line of credit can eventually evolve into a cash value policy, right Mo? So if you have a secured line of credit like this couple is likely to get for 30 grand, at some point I would tell them, hey, release that, graduate, from a 30K secure to an unsecured 30K. Have them give you your 30K back, you dump your 30K into your own banking system, whole life insurance, right? Boom, now you have your own line, the bank has an open-ended revolving line of credit for you. So now you got two, now you got two, I like that. Yeah, TSP Max, you're 19.5, 3600, cool. Ask yourself why are why are still maxing these retirement vehicles and deferring your taxes mean you have to pay higher taxes for sure in the future. Okay, that's key. Talking to Mo instead of redirecting some money to a policy, becoming your own line of credit. Okay, so key just made the same point that I just made. Is she added to the fact that you know with your uh, with your TSP, not the HSA and the Roth, that has its tax advantages. So I'm I'm not against HSAs. I'm not against Roths. Your TSP though, even if you're getting a match, you know, even if you're, you know, they're they're adding money to it and it's, it says it's earning this, man, that deferred taxes is, is a killer. Number one, number two, inflation. And then number three, fees. Even if you have 1% in annual fees, you have to understand that 1% compounds on the increased number. So if you have, uh, 50 grand in year one, they charge you 1%, that's $500 you pay to them, okay? Then in year two, you grow to 75,000, right? Times 1%, your cost just went up $250 in one year. Can you imagine doing that over and over and over again for 30, 40 years? And let's say you get to a million dollars in your account times 1%, that's $10,000. And let's say that million you lose 20% in one year because the market crashed. So that's 800,000. Guess what? You still got to pay 1%, eight grand, right? Regardless of your account going up or down, you have to pay annual fees and those fees compound year over year. So it makes it even harder. You, you, you have to have a higher rate of return just to cover your cost of investing, taxes, inflation. So you got three things to worry about. With the cash value life insurance policy, not that I'm comparing the two because you shouldn't, because this is not an investment. The other thing is an investment, but with a cash value policy, the only thing you have to worry about is the cost of the policy in the beginning years, and then the cost goes away. Once you're done funding it, you got no more costs. So there is an end to cost with the policy, which is cool. And then you've got the, you have a guaranteed compounding annual growth rate. And the cost of a policy doesn't charge annually. It's flat. It's a flat cost, right? And like I said, the cost actually goes down eventually to zero once you fully funded the account, right? And then it's wise to collateralize the account back into the investing world and create double digit returns, you know? And the more control you have over the investment, the higher your, uh, the higher your return will be.